In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, hello, hello. Ryan Roxy here and welcome to another edition of In the Trenches podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you are tuning in on Apple or Spotify or any of those other platforms, get your butt over to YouTube or Facebook Live because you want to see our guests as well, don't you? And if you are watching on YouTube right now, please hit that subscribe button because we have a very, very special guest today. It's, I, you know what? I was wondering why I have a little bit of you stress, not di not distress, you stress in my body. It's a good kind. It's, it's the type of stress that gets you energized and excited. It's because of our guest today. Um, I do talk a lot about him in interviews uh, we've played together in not just one band, a couple different bands. Uh, we'll talk about all that kind of stuff. But um, most of all, I've learned so much about rock and roll from this guy. And right before the show, when I was doing the math on my fingers, and that's about as good as my math gets, it's over 30 years that we've known each other, quite possibly going into going mid 30s all right let's say that <laughs> but you're gonna you're gonna love them um that's why you're already in the chat room right now i appreciate you guys showing up early and if you have some great questions for our guests please put them in again if you're watching it and listening to it um on apple or spotify you can come over to our live stream right now which is uh the youtube channel ryan rocks the official and just subscribe to that button but please let's start the in the trenches show today because i couldn't be happier to invite our good friend, my good friend, and soon to be yours. Uh, welcome to Into the Trenches, Gilby Clark. Hey, hey, Roxy, how are you, my friend? How you doing, man? I'm great. I'm great. Happy to be here, man. <laughs> I, I so I wanted to give this whole big introduction about how you know you, we've been going through all these crazy times in 2020, and we've been shut down. We've been you know through riots, looting, uh, pandemics, and all this kind of stuff. But then I was just going to say, you know what? Our first guest comes from Cleveland, Ohio, originally, <laughs> <laughs> and and that would just make things even out. And now you've been living in Los Angeles. So I I mean I know you as as Mr. Los Angeles because that's where I met you, but you. Mm -hmm. You, born and raised from Cleveland, and uh, how are you holding up through all these times in 2020 so far? Yeah, well, thanks for asking. But uh, uh, you know, I've been actually great. Um, you know, I have uh, I have a lot of hobbies. You know, so what this has done for me is given me time to really kind of concentrate on other things besides, you know, uh, you know, touring and making records and things like that. So um, I. I uh, you know, you probably haven't seen it yet, but, you know, I put a full uh, motorcycle shop in my garage and I now have like a mill and a lathe and welding equipment and drill presses and all kinds of things. So I've been kind of going crazy in the garage and building lots of things. Well, motorcycles have always been uh, not just a hobby. It's been sort of your lifestyle ever since I met you. You are actually, you know, truly one, a, a real biker. You've, you know, you're not just one of those weekend warrior bikers. You've had bikes the entire time I've met you. Um, you've gone, not just played Sturgis, which is the biggest bike fest in the States for those European listeners, but it, you've also played it, but you've ridden your bike there from Los Angeles multiples of times. I mean, what got you into the whole motorcycle world? Well, actually, Ryan, it goes back to uh, to Cleveland. When I was uh, a little kid, I had a Hells Angels clubhouse across the street from us when I was re like really, really little. And actually, my uh, my best friend, when, when I was younger, um, he lived with his brother in the house next door to that. So, you know, we idolized, you know, th those club members and stuff. You know, we would peek out the window when it got late at night. We weren't allowed outside. And we watch all the motorcycles going up and down the street. But, you know, people would think that they were like, you know, too crazy for the neighborhood. But actually, they were very respectful of the neighborhood. But, yeah, just seeing those guys out my window and out, you know, on the street and stuff, just, you know, just I idolized them. You know, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. This is a weird coincidence because you grew up with a Hells Angels clubhouse across the street. Our week, our last week's guest, Michael Monroe, lived in New York City, right on top and uh, next door to the Eleventh uh, Street, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hells Angels clubhouse, right there for many years. So um, we do have a lot of Hells Angels. Uh, I guess maybe, hopefully, we are endorsed right now. I'm wearing my California. Hope my colors are right on. Uh, legit. <laughs> 
you know, but if you're listening to it, you're listening to it like, yeah. And it's, been, it's, we're just talking. So the motorbikes are too loud anyway. Motorbikes. What am I, you know, I, I feel like I'm a moped guy at that point, but I, I never, I never owned a motorcycle back in, just so give you a little context, folks, uh, Gilby and I met each other in the maybe early mid eighties, right yeah. around there. And, um, we I joined his band, which was called Candy. And from that day on, then all of hair metal exploded, that whole cat house, Ricky Rackman, Tammy Down scene. In fact, there it is, our producer. <laughs> Got a lot of hair there. <laughs> that was a lot of hair and a lot of hairspray, if you guys can imagine. I think the best way to describe how we met in Candy is that if you guys want to go and watch that episode of uh, Brady Bunch, uh, the Johnny Bravo, where he we where he wears the suit, because I kind of fit in with you guys at that point. Yeah, yeah. And, you're perfect. But explain explain to people what Candy was and how it kind of fit in the scene, but it didn't either. Yeah. Well, Candy was interesting because, you know, like you said, you know, hard rock and metal was really happening at that time. And to be honest, you know, I was really never. A metal guy, you know, a hard rock guy. I mean, I, you know, of course I liked, you know, bands like Judas Priest and Black Sabbath, but, you know, I, it wasn't really my thing. I actually liked a lot of English, you know, uh, music, you know, like I, I loved The Clash. Uh, I loved The Pretenders when they came out in like 1980. So Candy was really just about four guys that kind of like different music. And we all kind of had that Ramones kind of black hair, leather jackets, torn jeans look. But our music was much more on the pop side, you know. It's like people would say we're like the Bay City Rollers, which we really weren't. I mean, we had like loud guitars and stuff, but the music was definitely more on the pop side. You know, we definitely idolized like Billy Idol and things like that. But uh, so, yeah, when the band started, it was the early 80s. And then, uh, you know, we had made a record. Uh, you know, we were, uh, did a video. We we're on tour and all those kind of things. But, you know, things weren't really working. And bands like Poison and Motley Crue were really getting big. So we kind of thought there was time to make some changes. So uh, our singer wasn't really get, uh, getting along with the band and stuff. So he left the band and uh, and we found you, Ryan. And uh, you were like the perfect candidate for the band. I, you, I'm a, I think I fit the leather jacket. I definitely use the same brand of uh, of hair dye. Do you remember that brand? <laughs> it was or, I uh, probably still use it today. <laughs> The best hero in rock and roll. <laughs> I always wear hats, but Gil, you don't have to. That's great. Uh, what happened? <laughs> no, what was it? Black Azure. Uh, 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 I got geez, boys. I, I can't. Re I, you know, I can't remember. But it yeah, was, it was like uh, black and blue or something like that. Yeah, and it was definitely Aquanet unscented. I always oh, yeah. tried to go for the unscented, but sometimes you had to sacrifice the scented <laughs> at the show. You had yeah. to do whatever was left over in the store. <laughs> <laughs> you, you ended up smelling like a like a pensioner, an older lady. Lady that had a, a bouffant hair or Mike Monroe's haircut for that matter. Um, <laughs> so, true. so we did, we did candy for a few years. We played around in um, the thing that I enjoyed about being in candy, of course, just learning the ropes and all of a sudden jumping into a band that was popular among the LA scene. Um, I remember one of my most, uh, I, it's sort of etched in my head is that you guys were known. So I sort of rode the coattails. In fact, maybe that's a pattern of my life right now. I get to ride the <laughs> coattails of a lot of acts that are already established. But uh, I, we ended up going into a gig one night at the Roxy and uh, everybody knew who you were. And the band was Candy, but we were there to see two new up and coming bands. And one was LA Guns, and they oh, were wow. opening up for another band called Guns N' Roses. Oh, that, yeah. and, and, and I remember it, all of us kind of looked at each other and we said, Well, okay. I guess we're going to start playing heavier and, and, yeah. and, 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 and things kind of changed collectively yeah. for all of us, which of course, you know, years later and his, the way history works itself out, you end up playing and maybe you even played in an LA guns uh, band lineup at one point. <laughs> Probably. Is that the rite of passage? You might've played in all those bands. <laughs> exactly. Because all, you know, for, for everybody, pretty much knows the story of Gilby Clark of, of that band of being yeah. a GNR, but I, I don't think, and this is why I wanted you to on the podcast. So we could talk about the other types of bands, the, the, the other bands that you've been in with candy and mm -hmm. kill for thrills, mm -hmm. Colonel Parker, maybe oh, yeah. a few of you out there don't, uh, don't uh, know that 
Gilby play guitar for Nancy Sinatra. Yeah. He did some touring with uh, Heart, Heart as yeah. well. And don't forget uh, rock star Supernova. So, I mean, and, and, and it goes on and on. So it's just not just one uh, one band, maybe one band that people associate you yeah. with and then go from there. But also, this is what I think is the most impressive mm-hmm. when I was doing the research, eight solo records, right? Is this going to yeah. be your... You know, the, I, I've lost count, Ryan. <laughs> Thank God you're I, counting. I didn't. <laughs> eight of them. That, that's including blues. Yeah. That's, that is including the blues. EP blues, and I was on that. Yeah, you're perfect. on that record, too. Yes, yes there you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. That's what's funny is, it, you know, it's interesting. I mean, as far as the solo record stuff, you know, I never intended, you know, to be a solo artist. It was really just a matter of at that time it was right when gnr had gotten off the you know like a long road trip and uh and we weren't going to do anything for a while you know and i had a bunch of songs you know from a- another band the black house which was in between kill for thrills and uh and guns and roses i had a band called the blackouts and that's where songs like tijuana jail were written and uh and i didn't have anything really to do with those songs you know it's like you know gene r wasn't interested you know the band was going to make a record so i made the first solo record pawn shop guitars and then as time went by it just kind of like oh you know you got some new songs you have enough songs for a record let's make another record then another one and like i said now we have <laughs> but eight <Poncho>. solo records <laughs> look at that vinyl <laughs> And here's the thing, what I find very interesting, because it all comes back again. In the new video, I find you in a guitar pawn shop. Yes, course. I know. And, and then we'll talk about the video now. later. <laughs> We're gonna, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it is funny how things do come complete circle. So we're in Candy. And then that band, I, I, when I tell the history of it, it basically splintered off into Kill for Thrills and the band that I joined with the other guys in Candy called Electric Angels. Mm-hmm. And we actually would play the same uh, clubs. We'd play the same scene. We were in that uh, mid-80s, you know, sort of, uh, I guess it would. you can't really say hair metal. Yeah, because it wasn't hair metal at all. You're right, yeah. I mean, it I always was- thought it's funny because we, we had clubs like Scream and, 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 and Cat House and uh, White Trash. And those, th- like, yeah. you know, you could probably consider Cat House maybe a little more along the hair metal things where Ricky would never let you say that. But of course not. They, it really wasn't. You know, band, you know, um, you know, they would have, uh, uh, you know, Alice in Chains, you know, played Cat House and stuff. Yeah, Alice in Chains, I was going to say, Alice in Chains was very, very popular amongst the, the Scream and sort of the downtown club and yeah. the Dance Chains Carters Addiction and, you know, all yeah. those bands. So it's it's funny. It's like I think people have a, a very uh, distorted view of what those years really was. It wasn't just one scene. It was a lot of different scenes, you know. And, and like you said, we weren't really a part of the metal thing, the Sunset Strip thing. Even though we did play the Roxy, the Whiskey, the Troubadour, we really weren't a part of it, you know. Yeah, but we kind of, we were able to sort of, be, because of your guys' history with that, because I know that you had, you had uh, lasted through the first yeah. wave of metal because yeah. you were the pop rock band, but you know, you always played with a Les Paul and looked cool as fuck. So that kind of gave you a pass amongst the wasp fans, the rat yeah. fans, the motley fans. And then when that switch made to the, like you said, the newer bands like mm-hmm. poison and GNR and faster pussycat. Um, then all of a sudden we, we kind of fit in there as well, but yeah. you know, we eventually went to New York. You guys uh, went, stayed in Los Angeles. Kill for Thrills made how many records was that? We made, we made two records. I mean, really one and a half. <laughs> one and a half. Okay. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Well, I still remember the day you called me and you said, "You said, hey man, I'm in New York. Uh, or actually, I'm in Boston." But I'm oh yeah, that's right. You were at the, at the, at the mm-hmm. very first gig I did with GNR. Yeah. Second, I don't know if you were right? at it. It's a, it, I was it at no, the second. Oh, the second one, but it was at the same place. Yeah. Yeah. You called me, no, because didn't you play Boston Garden first yeah, night? And yeah. Then- oh, did you go to the New York one? But yeah, I saw you guys in Boston. It was which was my first show with the band, and uh, oh, yeah. and like I said, I, I saw you guys like when when I was there. <laughs> I, I do remember that too. 
Barely. I just remember getting a call saying, Hey, I'm playing New York. So, you know, you want to come to the show? And I said, Yeah, of course, man. What club? And you go, It's not a club. It's, it's <laughs> Madison Square Garden. And, that, and this was before, folks. You have to understand this is before you could just put it on Twitter or put yeah, it on yeah. your, your Insta story. It yeah. was like, No, this was something that was big. And I somehow kept it really under wraps. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It happened so fast. It's kind of like what happened. It was kind of like, Oh my God, you're in the band and, you know, we're playing a show next week. So it did happen. <laughs> happen really really quick <laughs> well i remember when i first joined the cooper band he gave me a lot of songs to learn in a very short period of time I, did you get the same sort of thing uh, uh no you know that's the funny thing about the gnr thing was gnr never had a set list you know it, it's axel would call the songs out so i asked them i said can you just give me your set list which would probably be 20 to 23 songs and they go no you have to learn them all i had to learn the whole 50 song catalog uh basically in a week to do my first show with the band that's considerably more than less than minor that's a lot of work <laughs> that's, that's way more work than i ever did in my whole career with alice cooper are you kidding me yeah. shit so you learned you learned everything and just for the everything. audibles yeah yeah just yeah. for the audibles and, and i gotta tell you ryan that i i've told this story a few times but it's kind of funny but axel if anybody knows Axel, he has a very low, deep speaking voice. And when you're on stage and you've been on the GNR stage with, with the loud amps and the hiss of the loud amps, and he would he would call the songs out. So whoever started the song, he'd walk up to you and he'd go, uh, you know, don't cry. And I'd look around, I'd go, did he say you could be mine? <laughs> like, I, I couldn't really hear him. <laughs> and off the bat, our hearing isn't 100%. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've all played in, I've played with uh, Gilby. I know how loud he is. I've played in a band with Slash. I know how loud Slash is. I can't imagine how loud playing in a band with Gilby and Slash at the same time would be. So, <laughs> yeah, it was a little loud. <laughs> I was all before in airs and all that stuff. <laughs> And but again, one of the the constant uh, companions that you always had was a cool guitar. You always you had a go to. Usually it was a Les Paul. I remember yeah, even definitely. before the GNR days, uh, you would actually let me borrow this amazing Les Paul custom. It was heavy yeah. as hell. Yeah, it weighed, it weighed about as much as probably your wife did at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, and it was, but but it sounded so good. It was was there a little bit of history because I think that was the diamond one, the diamond one, yeah, yeah, which got was, stolen unfortunately. But yeah, yeah, was that was that owned by someone or or did no, that's my guitar, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I had I've I had that guitar forever. It was like a late seventies Les Paul, and like you said, it was so frigging heavy. But I, at that time, I'd switched over. I, I had that uh, that black standard, and I was kind of playing that one all the time. So that one got neglected, but yeah, you know, I loaned that guitar to a friend of mine. Um, and you know, I, I loaned it to you. I loaned to, got my guitar. <laughs> you loaned it to everybody. Yeah, I loaned I it to everybody. It. <laughs> yeah, but I, unfortunately, the last person I loaned it to, I didn't get it back. Uh, it actually Ouch. got stolen. So yeah. that's a bummer. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know during that time because we sort of grew up Gibson Marshall guys, mm -hmm. but then because you're playing with Slash, and I understand it, you wanted a different, a tiny bit of a different tone, yeah. and then you obviously went for an amp company that's you know, so iconic and, and so world renowned with bands like the, whether it's the Beatles or whether it's queen, but you yeah. started a wall of Vox. Amps. I remember that. Right? <laughs> I had a lot of AC thirties. <laughs> yeah. You know what it was, was when I first started with GNR, I mean, even though slash is a, is a Les Paul Marshall guy and I was a Les Paul Marshall guy, you know, he played with, you know, a lot more gain than I did, but sometimes we would hit like a chord and I honestly had no idea who hit the chord. I, I couldn't tell. And, um, and so I just needed something to, you know, just so I can kind of pick my sound out when we're on stage. Cause once again, everything was really, really loud back then. And the, the, all the monitors really were just Axel's vocals. It's not like we could have our guitars, you know, follow us. So yeah, I started playing AC thirties, which I had done a long, long time before that. And I, and I kind of forgot about it, but man, they were, they were perfect. It's like it, if you turn an AC 30 up all the way, it really is like a great Marshall. It's just got a little bit more mid range, you know? And, yeah, and, and it cuts. It, I remember it cutting. <laughs> it, 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 it would definitely cut through a lot of the, the, the clubs and venues that we eventually played with your solo band, which exactly. I'm getting to. Um, <laughs> so through all this, mm -hmm. what happens? Cause I always say Gilby is a, you know, guitarist, singer, songwriter, 
but then he becomes a producer and I, and tell me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but I feel because you've always helped us with our demos throughout the candy days. And, and yeah. then even with electric angels, you, you had, you know, your, your hands in that. And obviously with my bands, whether it's dad's porno mag or whether it's Roxy 77, you've always been a great producer when it comes, you, you just get it. You get, you, and you don't, take a lot of time uh getting that sound getting that you know the mix and yeah. you know the tone. so i'd say and tell me if i'm wrong or tell me how it all came about you became a bona fide producer when you mixed your own single off the first pawn shop guitars album called yeah. cure me or kill me that's true that single because you said you know what I, I got this. I know what it sounds like. How did that story go about? <laughs> That's funny, Ryan. That's funny you remember that. But uh, yeah, we, when we were doing, uh, well, like, like you said, you know, I, I, before in the early candy days, you know, my day job was a sound man at all the clubs in LA. You know, I worked everywhere from, you know, Wong's to the lingerie. I did the Roxy, the whiskey. And that kind of taught me about sounds and like you said, quickly, <laughs> you know, sometimes you just have to get it very, very fast and, and, and go with the mix. But it taught me. And so, you know, we learned from the studio, you know, just working in it and, and getting sounds and and listening to songs and just kind of, you know, kind of hearing what's the best part about the song. And to me, it's always simple. Whatever's the best part of the song, just turn it up the loudest. But <laughs> I really learned arrangements. And I think that was kind of from the pop background, you know, of listening to all those, you know, 70s AM radio, you know, hits and stuff, you know, it's just quick to the chorus. So that's what, what kind of got me into it. But when the pawn shop record came along, you know, I, I hired Thompson and Barbieros to mix a record who I thought did a fantastic job, but somehow cure me or kill me, you know, it, it just, it wasn't where I wanted it to be. And, and you probably remember this but back in those days, I, I kept playing that urge overkill sister yeah. Havana song. Like, yeah. over oh, and dude, over. I, I play it to this day <laughs> to, in order to get a good guitar sound or whatever. It's still oh, such a great mixed. It's a, such a good if, if, Vic, if you can put up that graphic of urge overkill, I always tell our producer to put up stuff. It's impossible <laughs> for him to put up. Yeah. <laughs> but but there was a band called Urge Overkill. I think they were from the Midwest as well. They were right? from Chicago. Chicago. I actually, yeah, I got to know them a little bit later. But yeah, they That's had cool. a, I mean, it was, a, it was a perfect, you know, pop rock song. You know, it was it, it loud guitars, drums were, were slamming, but it had a great pop melody to it. And when I was doing Cure Me or Kill Me, man, I kept putting it up and going, guys, this is what we're going for. And I actually called the mixer that did it in, Oddly enough, the mixer was a rap guy. He had done rap records. So that record, the drums were all sampled. They were, they were played live, oh, wow. but they were sampled. Okay. Now, we didn't sample, you know, back then. But what it did was it just let me kind of, you know, work on those sounds a little more. And like the direction that I went with the drums and the guitars, you know, nobody else were, was going. And, and it really was just kind of being drying in the face, you know. But, but yeah, I, I mix that song. I, I still think it sounds good to this day. Oh, are you kidding me? I mean... Just so for some homework for our listeners again out there, if you are watching us on YouTube, your first homework assignment is to subscribe to the channel. All right, just do that for me. But then afterwards, go check out Gilby Clark because uh, I I'm in that video as well. Gilby Clark, exactly. hear me or kill me. You'll hear you'll get a lot of bang for your buck because I remember the day that uh, we recorded that video. I think. Your wife, Daniela, was days away from giving birth, right? Yeah, she yeah, was, she's pregnant. She was pretty in much the video. ready to pop, yeah, right? Yeah, very much so. <laughs> Hoping she would pop on the video. <laughs> and that was a psychedelic type of vibe on it. It's a cool yeah. video. Uh, Mark Denzison's in the video. Um, Will Efforts. Mm -hmm. that, and so it was Will Efforts, Mark Denzison, uh, myself. Mm -hmm. And I know that Joe. Um, from Dogs to More, he was a part of the band as well before. So yeah. that was that sort of was the, the the Gilby Clark and the Tequila Brothers. Yes, and that's a that's a good uh, video to go check out. And then obviously afterwards, go check out Urge Overkill, Sister Sister Havana. Havana. Yeah, yeah. Havana. <laughs> well, there, can you believe he came Come up with on, it? Come on, man, he's, that's he's great. quick. He's that's really quick. Good. All right, I, I'm going to listen to that afterwards. Yeah. But so so you produced. Mm -hmm. um, not just your own solo albums after that. You also produced a band called De Bronx. Oh, which, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and let me ask you this. Do you like being on stage, performing, playing, or do you like being behind letting, you know, 
making magic happen? What's your what's your f- favorite? Spot? I think it's really a combination of both. I, I you know I think in the perfect world, you know, you 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 tour during the summer and you record records in the winter, you know, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, and also times have changed, you know, rec- records, you know, don't have the budgets that they used to have. So it's a little bit harder to make the records that you want to make. A lot of people do it themselves now, but um, the Bronx record actually came from our good buddy, Jonathan Daniel, you know, Jonathan was managing the band and he suggested it. And, and I took a meeting with the guys and I sat in the middle of their rehearsal room. They had like a tiny rehearsal room in Hollywood. And I sat in the middle and I listened to them play, you know, their, their set of uh, their tracks. And I go, you know, we got to kind of cut this record live. I mean, you know, to me, all bands have a great first record, you know, but it's got to be dirty. It's got, it's got to, it, it can't be that Pro Tools clean and tight. It's got to be noisy. It's got to, you know, it's got to be raw. So cheap that's trick, cheap trick. <laughs> first cheap, cheap trick, trick one, of, one of the greatest. First, yeah. It's so, so great. Exactly. But that's raw. You listen to how they developed over the years, you know, from that first record. That That's just like almost like one guitar, really. You know, it's barely two guitars on that record. Yeah. But, I, but I agree yeah, with you. It, it, you gotta, and that's the thing is, you know, it, there's so many forces against you when you're making a record. So many things have to, uh, you know, come come in line together to really make a great record. You know, it's not just about having great songs, but it's about having great performances and people all on the same page. It's like, you know, if you have a band where there's four guys, they don't always agree. Then you have a producer, then you have a label, then you have a manager, and then you have a girlfriend or a wife. <laughs> You know, it's, it's nearly impossible. To Sometimes make the girlfriend work. or the wife is the manager. You never exactly. know. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, that's one of those records where it just really worked. I mean, and to be honest, we we were butting heads in, in the mix stage. And what's funny is we ended up going back to the very first mixes that I did that I handed in. But it went the long way around <laughs> to get back to the beginning mixes. But it just goes to show. Sometimes, you know, you don't know what you want until you hear it. Right. Well, you've you've done eight of your own solo albums. Do you have, do you have one that's uh, sort of pops out from the others, or do you take each one individually? Well, I mean, I do take one every one individually. To me, records marked a period of time. You know, it's what you're listening to, what you feel at that time, and hopefully they do. Um, to me, the Pawn Shop record is always going to be my favorite. It just because that record was songs from you know ten years before and. It was kind of almost like a best of at that point. Um, that record just really, I mean, if anybody ever asked me, you know, who, who are you as an artist? I, I just, that record, it, it covers everything. You know, the guitar, there's 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 rock on it. There's pop on it. There's blues. There's a little Beatles on there. It's a little bit. Of, and I got all my friends on there. So, you know. Well, let me tell you something. I mean, pop, maybe not you, but for me, we spend a lot of other people's money on that album. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remember that was the end of the big budgets. <laughs> whenever I tell people, they go, "Well, how'd you start your touring career with Alice?" Well, let's go a little bit farther back because when I really first saw the world playing music, that yeah, was yeah. with Gilby Clark. Because I remember, you know, I remember flying all the way to Japan just for two or three songs for me just to hang out with you and, yeah. and do a little bit of a promotion tour. Like I said, I think that was called the Ryan's Vacation Tour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I gained weight. Oh, yeah, I gained weight on that tour because because that's where I that's where I discovered that record company people wanted you to order more so they could fulfill their budget for the next act. So they would be like saying, "Yeah, do you want an appetizer? Of course. Oh, yeah. And what, do you want? Um, of course. What's your main course? And a dessert, and an after drink, and, and an something after to take party. home <laughs> back to the hotel. <laughs> wow, I don't even think we went back to the hotel. Uh, <laughs> no, nothing. exactly, exactly. We'll just order room service on them, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I remember that was, that. That was a promo tour, right? That was the first promo yeah. tour. That was the first time yeah. I was actually able to go to a lot of places in Europe and yeah. in Japan and stuff like that. But then we eventually went down uh, probably one of the uh, most Beatlemania esque moments of my uh, career. It just and even just to be a fly on the wall. And I said, like I was riding the coattails long before Alice Cooper, folks, for those of you that are keeping track at home. But I we I went down uh, with the with the Keeler brothers, with Will and with um Mark, uh, Mark D and with uh Big Susan Earl. Crane, remember and Susan Crane? <laughs> of course. We went down to uh South America 
and we opened up for a little band called Aerosmith. And at that point in time, I must tell you, <laughs> Gilby Clark's album had just been released in South <laughs> South America, and there were more fans around around the actual hotel that had been barricaded. By the way, folks, I'm not joking. I wish <laughs> Vic, we roll up some, uh, put up some footage of that. No, he doesn't have it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> But it's I, all been erased. <laughs> somewhere on YouTube, there's footage of a barricaded uh, Gilby Clark in Argentina. Now, yeah. how do you still remember that first trip down to Argentina, and how it was? How did all those how did all those stars collide and and turn out to what it was as far yeah. as the tour? That was, I mean, to be honest, Ryan, that was like a magical time. You know, I mean, when people always ask me, like, what's your favorite show you've ever done? You know, I mean. You know, the, the GNR show, the Freddie Mercury tribute show is one of the greatest shows like I was ever a part of. But also that show of us opening for Aerosmith in Buenos Aires is one of my favorite moments in my life. You know, and it was it just it was a magical time. You know, I mean, for me, it was, you know, a, a, a lot of luck too. you know, coming off the GNR tour. You know, we have been down there quite a few times and, you know, selling out stadiums down there. And, and like you said, you know, the, the fans outside the hotel. It was just perfect timing. I can't. I was the first one who came after that, and uh, you know the the single, even against my wishes, was "Dead Flowers," which Axel sang on, and uh, it was just it was just perfect timing. You know, it's like rock was just so they were so hungry for it at that point. And remember, not everybody went down there at that time. You know, it was we we were it. Well, I just remember at one point, you know, you told me you looked at me and you said, "Dude, when we get <laughs> off this plane." It's going to be chaos, and you know me and Mark, guys are going. Yeah, yeah, there he goes Mark, again. Yeah. Each other guys go, yeah, well, it'll be fine. And it was literally chaos. At one point, folks, there was a dog chasing Gilby <laughs> down the street. A dog. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were literally we were in the van and there was motorcycles and a dog running as well and i was like oh, man that dog's a big fan <laughs> i don't know how he got the record but man <laughs> and, and i believe that was also where we learned about uh saliva being oh, yeah. a, a term of endearment even though I thought it was raining and, and but the, the sky was completely sunny, all of a sudden I feel all these droplets. I'm like, oh, it's going to rain. No, it's not. It's completely uh, sunny. And it was people spitting. What is the deal with that, Gil? Yeah, that I, I mean, I learned too because, you know, we learned a hard lesson. But uh, that's it. That came from the Ramones. Um, you know, the Ramones were really the first rock band that went down to uh, South America and Argentina in, in general. And, uh, and they are the ones who taught him that. Dee Dee was the one who was spitting on him, and so they'd spit back at him. And they really thought, you know, that is what they were supposed to do. That's what the bands loved. They didn't realize they really hated it. <laughs> you know, it was disgusting. <laughs> I remember a shoe coming up on stage one night. And like, <laughs> what are you going to do with the other shoe? <laughs> <laughs> How are they walking around one shoe? <laughs> well, thank you, Aaron, for, for turning off Aerosmith. We were opening up for Aerosmith, yeah. and I actually think that on that tour – didn't Steven Tyler or Joe, someone got some spit in their mouth? Like uh, oh, no, it, it, actually, it wasn't that tour. I think I told you a story where Slash, uh, I remember in the GNR tour, uh, Slash got hit in the mouth and he he hurled. Like it, it hit him and he just got sick right on the spot. Yeah. I, I, I didn't, I just, I got a little bit on the shoulders and stuff like that. But I do remember that the first show, it was kind of like raining shoes yeah. and raining shoes coins and, <laughs> and then the coins. next the very next show what they had these huge industrial type fans yeah right these, like, <laughs> these big these big wind fans and they were they would actually blow this the saliva back into the audience yeah someone had the great idea turn around the other way <laughs> of course we were sweating to death but at least we weren't covering loogies <laughs> Well, we are moving on now from <laughs> South America. I don't want to. Let's go back. Come on, I I know, I know, so my fun. it is right when I sit when I sit here and I talk about it. I go, "Fuck, that's really cool." But I want to bring us up to present date because you are still, you know, carrying the torch of rock and roll. In fact, the 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 newest album you just started 
a, a big promotion blitz. You're having three singles come out. The first one that came out, can you tell us a little bit about it? And then we can talk about the new video and stuff. <laughs> so uh, the new song is called uh, Rock and Roll is Getting Louder. And to me, you know, everybody's been talking about, you know, rock and roll is dead. You know, it's uh, it's, you know, not as popular as it used to be and stuff. And, and some of that may be true. But, you know, to me, rock and roll is the underdog, man, where it should be. It's dirty. It's, it's you know, it's, it's supposed to be. And uh, so my this song is really just kind of about, hey, man, rock and roll is here. It, it's loud. It, it's alive. It's, it's whatever you really want it to be. And to me, the first single from the record should be just a, a loud guitar in your face, Stonesy kind of anthem. And that's what the song is. So when you did the video for it, um, I, I, you know, because I know that in your in your current touring band, you you have TPF, don't you have Troy Patrick? Yeah, yeah, Troy, you yes. EJ, EJ Curse. So I, I see a couple guys in the band. I see EJ Curse in the band. Who was who played drums in the video? Who was well, that? Uh, well, uh, in the video is actually Jimmy Deanda played drums uh, because right. Troy Troy uh, was getting married uh, like the next day from when we did the video. Gotcha. But uh, actually on the record is Kenny Aronoff uh, played drums on the record and uh, Muddy played bass on the record. So oh, it's kind of strange because what's played on the record and what's in the video are actually two different things. Dude, I, you know all these names. You say them with first name basis, and I know exactly who you think. You know, who oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Muddy, is it Muddy Stardust? Is it? Is it what, I'm the one that started the Stardust thing as a joke. <laughs> really? But his, his, his name is Mark Dutton, uh, but his nickname has always been Muddy. He's kind of like a first name guy, Muddy. But yeah, Muddy Dutton or Muddy Stardust. We It's kind of, you know. Played in Burning Tree, amazing yeah. bass player. Always had a bass with him because guess what? He traveled with a bass in his trunk. Yeah, <laughs> I remember it like it was yesterday, man. Without a case, <laughs> and he he is actually another lost angel as well. So okay, so they played on the track, but yeah. when you go and check out the video, which is available. Don't be switching to it right now, folks. All right, we're in the middle of the podcast. <laughs> Wait till we're done. You are watching in the trenches with Ryan Roxy. We have our special guest Gilby Clark, and um, so what I want you to do though is imagine this video unless we have a little clip of it and we can talk about some of the guest stars that are in that video because it's a bunch of old friends and some yes. guys you've played with for years and was that on purpose or did you just uh, needed some extras what how did that work <laughs> is a little bit of both ryan but what, what it was was i i had this idea and i stole the i don't know if, if you noticed but the very end thing i stole from pulp fiction um, I got that. Yeah. Good man. Good man. Um, so I wanted to be, it to kind of be a journey. You know, I'm searching for something. I have this photograph and, you know, you don't know what it is. Is it, a, you know, a person I'm looking for? You know, is it a thing? What is it that I'm looking for? So I'm going to like all my favorite places. You know, I go, I go to a bar. I go to a cigar store. I go to a guitar store. I go to a record store. And, and then the last one, I go to a pawn shop. And, um, so when we were filming it, we really just thought I'd call these places that, that I know and let me film. I just called the person, hey, man, you know, you, you own the place. You, can you be the person I hand the photograph to? And at first they were like, yeah, but then, you know, Hollywood, you think everybody wanted to be an actor, but people started <laughs> getting weird. Like, oh, I don't want to do that. And so I had to, on the spot, I called Teddy and Teddy called, came down and he did the very first uh, uh, cameo spot. And then it, you know, it triggered then after that, we got Slim Jim Phantom. Uh, we got uh, Tammy Down. Uh, we got my good buddy, uh, Jimmy Harold from Hillbilly Harold. And, uh, uh, and Tammy, of course, we got good old Tammy is at the very end. He's the pawn shop owner. Um, actually, Billy Gibbons was supposed to be the pawn shop owner, but uh, it was right when the, all this was starting the uh, uh, the pandemic oh, wow. and he, yeah. he couldn't get, uh, he couldn't get to town. He was stuck in Houston. Ah, bummer, bummer. Well, I'm sure he was, you know, probably complaining about a gig. Yeah, exactly. I can't believe it. I got, wait, you got a gig, <laughs> Teddy. but it's just so you guys know who we're talking about and put things yes. in context. Teddy zigzag is probably one of the greatest, uh, keyboardists, uh, organs, organ players and showmen. Yes. Uh, you know, behind the keys. Cause it's, cause uh, when you play with Teddy Zigzag, you take the whole package, mm -hmm. and uh, you you've had. Teddy you played with Teddy for years, and Alice. 
I played with him in Alice. I played with him in Roxy 77 and I played with him in your bands and in, in a bunch of your bands. Wasn't, was, was Teddy in Colonel Parker? Yes, well? he was. Yeah. Jim, Teddy Slim, was. Yep. Slim Jim Phantom as well. Yeah. All right. So see, we are bringing everybody back <laughs> together and you brought them all into this. The only person we're missing in that video, I think, is Dean Clark, which is Gilby's brother. Would you not make a cameo in that one? <laughs> yeah, I know. He's he's everywhere else we're around, isn't he? <laughs> so um, this new single, I know it's out right now, um, but when is the next single or the actual album? And what is the album title? And tell us about that one. So the, the name of the record is The Gospel Truth. And that's actually one of the songs on the record too. So that's going to be the next single. And that's actually coming out soon. That's uh, June 29th. The next single is going to come out. And we're going to follow it up with the video. You know, this. Um, I'm sure you know more than anybody, Ryan. This new way of doing things, you know, you got to kind of milk it with a single, a video, a, a, a lyric video, just kind of milk things along. Cause once the record's yeah, out, yeah. that's the end of it. So, you know, we want to just kind of put out a few singles. I think we're going to do three and then the al the full album will follow probably the end of the summer. Yeah. I, I am working on now my 10th lyric video for my solo album <laughs> because <laughs> each song has had an actual uh each song has had an actual single release because you were exactly right yeah. back in the old days you put you work your life to put something out and all of a sudden in you know a month people are like oh well what has he done lately it's like, what yeah i know i know isn't that crazy oh. I definitely have paced it out. Maybe I was early on that, but I was I, I did make a commitment from the beginning to put a lyric out, uh, video out for each and every song. So, yeah, you know, gives a little idea. bit of longevity as well. I mean, I know that you guys just did one of the Monsters of Rock Cruise live shows. And yeah. That sounded really good. I, in fact, that was what actually I, I heard it and I said, damn, that sounds really good. I want to maybe Gilby would be interested in coming on in the trenches. We can talk a little bit about that. How have you done other uh, monsters of rock cruises before? Or how did that all work out? Never. <laughs> I've never done one. Uh, I think how it came about was because Jimmy DeAnda has uh, done a couple live shows with me uh, when, when Troy wasn't available and Jimmy has worked with the monsters of rock cruise people quite a bit. So uh, bullet boys uh, did the first one and then they were asking around, you know, who'd like to do them. And so we were kind of uh, at the beginning of that. But to be honest, when I heard it, it was a little messy, the sound. Like, I love the visual effects, but it wasn't the band. I know the band sounded good. I, I just saw them live, like, maybe a month or two before. So we did have to work with them a little bit on the sound to try to get it. And, you know, of course, I'm still picky. I'm so, like, oh, wow, we could have fixed this. But, <laughs> but but it was good. I mean, the thing about my band is we're simple. You know, every, you know, since you haven't been in the band, I only have one guitar now. So, you know, well, hopefully we can't screw that you said, you said, you know, it needs another guitar. I said, you know what? It sounded great. We just, oh, we you. just, you holding it all down. Are you still, uh, are you still gravitating toward the Voxes or have you moved on to more of the modeling amps or are you going back to Marshall or is it some sort of hybrid of all of <laughs> It's a little bit of a hybrid. Yeah. I don't do the modeling amps. I'm still a, you know, a tube amp guy. Um, right. I have a, I, I have a, I have a couple, you know I mean? I still have my Marshalls, but uh, it depends on the show really. And like, you know, how loud I can be. Um, I, I've been uh, working with Vox quite a bit actually the last couple of years and I have a new amp by them. That's uh, really good. It really sounds like my old Voxes. Uh, but that, that day was actually my match list, um, which is basically just a Vox. They're, uh, you know, EL uh, yeah, uh, 84s. Yeah, I, I really like it. It's a 30 watts, so it kind of keeps my my volume under control. But uh, yeah, that's what I use that day. I have a Friedman too, which I really like. You know, I mean, there's, you know, th in this boutique world, there's so many great new amps. But yeah, I haven't been a modeling guy. I mean, I know you still play Marshall's Live too, and I, I, I still like the live amp. I do, but this last tour, everybody had made the jump because we brought a frigging castle, a castle <laughs> in 2019. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll still be erected in 2020 uh, at one point. But there's a castle on stage because there's not even enough room for a back line of amps. So, of course, uh -huh. I have my go-to Marshall half stack that's always there at the ready. But pretty much everybody has uh, mm -hmm. gone to a lot of the Kemper and and. Yeah. And of course we have, a, it does 
matter a lot if you have a sound technician that gets it and understands it can work with it. You're right. So, I mean, I've played the campers. Like I've recorded with the campers. I think they're fantastic. I mean, you know, to be honest, up until till the camper, I really hated them. But once, you know, I got, got my hands on one and got to play one. I go, wow, you know, these, these really are incredible. And, you know, they have that feel of that live amp feel, you know, so they're, they're pretty nice. Do you still have, um, I know there's a very famous Les Paul that you played all throughout the time that we played together in the pawn shop era. Uh, we just call, I just called it the burnt Les Paul. The burnt I me too. I <laughs> think thing. another name for it. But I mean, luckily the one good thing about playing with Gilby Clark folks is that uh, he's very generous with letting you borrow his guitar. So I played a lot of your cool guitars. Um, do you still have that burnt Les Paul and what's the Absolutely. story of that guitar? If you could tell the quick story of that guitar, it was great. I, I have to be very gentle when I tell this story because uh, the person who burnt my Les Paul is Elwood, and uh, Elwood uh, is actually went was my tech and went from me to uh, Billy Gibbons. And uh, Elwood, I had this brand new Les Paul. It was a, a Tobacco Sunburst, and it really played great. It sounded great. But man, it was just too shiny for me. I don't know. Something about it just irritated me. <laughs> so I wouldn't play it. And Elwood would go, why don't you play this guitar? It sounds great. I go, yeah, yeah, it ain't me. And one day I came up, he goes, hey, check out what I did to your guitar. And and I looked and it was, you know, he, it is what it is. He burnt it. He lit it on fire like four times. And, and I went, at first I went, what did you? Hey, you know, that actually looks kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, most guitar players would freak out, you know, by somebody burning their last ball. But I was never going to play it until he did that. But, yeah, I still have it. It's still a great sounding guitar. I, it's stock. It's completely stock. You know, I never changed it. And to be honest with you, that was a little bit before relicking. Became relicking, yeah. <laughs> He became in vogue and became really, but luckily now we have a guy in, that we both know that we both use Billy Rowe from Billy Rock and Rowe Roll Relics. And I know that you've had a, an actual uh, Rock and Roll Relics guitar come out at one point, right? And is yeah, that, I did. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so Billy, yeah, Billy had been actually before that had been painting a lot of my guitars, you know, like uh, I, um, you know, um, you know, you're a Gibson guy too. You know, sometimes you get a guitar from him, and once again, it's a little too shiny or or sunburst. I don't know oh, why they send me nitrocellulous. What is it? Nitrocellulous, nitrocellulous lacquer. Yeah. yeah, I just don't understand why they keep selling me sending me sunburst guitars. But I've never what played a sun. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I'm, you know, I, I like black. I like gold. You know, or burnt. So there you go. There it is. There's I, a super ace really dream guitar, folks. <laughs> the one I love. Right. Zebra pickups are beautiful, but uh, yeah. So I would send him the Billy, and he would, you know, do it. You know, make it a gold top, or like you said, just relic it. And then uh, I, I wanted a telly, but I wanted to do something kind of in the vein of like Wayne Kramer. I loved his strat that he had with like the American flag. So we kind of came up with the idea of, uh, you know, it's, it's a, like a black American flag. And, uh, and that's the, uh, the Telecaster that, that I have that Billy made me. That's awesome. For those of you that haven't checked out, I, I actually have a cataloged uh, interview with Billy Rowe from Rock and Roll Relics that we we talked before. I'm going to put it out. It, we haven't released it yet of In the Trenches podcast. So stay tuned, folks, because you will get to know a little bit more about Billy Rowe. But he... Uh, Billy's actually painting the, this motor. I'm, I'm actually... Built, sorry to interrupt you, Ryan, but I'm uh, building a motorcycle for George Lynch right now. And Billy uh, is painting that motorcycle right now as we speak <laughs> dude does it have a carton of milk on it because honestly <laughs> when i toured with doc and this is a true story george oh, yeah. lynch will back it up he was so into working out like he oh was yeah i am he would drink a carton of milk on stage and there was no there was no vodka cranberry <laughs> no vodka soda. it was a carton of milk and wow. in so is I, I don't know you, you're making a motorcycle for him uh, and obviously Billy Rowe it, it, it's very cool how uh, we all circulate still in the same circles because we all have one person that we know from another band that we've yes. even played with and stuff and when you mentioned Billy Gibbons I'm thinking man. Has Gilby ever played with Billy? And I think you have. Yeah, you lots of times. With, with, with Kings of Chaos, right? Yeah. Was that? Oh, wow. And yeah, yeah, that? exactly. How did I that mean, well, so Kings of Chaos is really Matt Sorum's project. You know, he um, he wanted to do, you, you remember they were doing the Camp Freddy project uh, at the, uh, I think it was the Roxy. And yeah, they stole our set list. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, 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 did. they did. They did. They admit it. it. <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, it, Camp Freddy kind of split up into two camps. Uh, one is Royal Machines and one is Kings of Chaos. And a lot of us are actually in both bands. <laughs> uh, it, the only difference is uh, Royal Machines is more of like a corporate band where they really don't do hard ticket sales, where Kings of Chaos will, you know, play casinos and, you know, uh, 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 sheds and and whatever you know whatever it gets booked on but kings of chaos is great ryan what's really nice about it for me is um i mean you know we all didn't start out in cover bands you know we were in original bands from day one i never learned songs unless i was in the band so it's taught me to you know really learn other people's material you know whether it's aerosmith or you know the cult oh, yeah. or sammy agar or, uh yeah, glenn hughes all those wonderful people yeah. but uh, yeah, so that's what that is. And it, it's been fun. But Billy, um, I, I got to tell you, and you're going to love this because you're a huge fan too, but uh, Robin Zander does a lot of Kings of Chaos gigs and, you know, he's our favorite singer in the world. And we did a show with Robin and Billy. It's like my favorite guitar player, my favorite singer. I really was in heaven. Man, I guess if I interview every single one of you, I, I, it'll be undeniable to be an honorary member of that band at one point. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I say it's the international set list, folks, because there is an international set list. Anytime you see any sort of group that has a bunch of musicians in it, they will definitely play their big hits from their band. Like if, if yeah. Dave Coverdale's in the band, you'll be hearing some White Snake songs. But I guarantee you also that you'll be hearing, you know, Surrender, 20th Century Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Joseph would have played at the cat house at that point. You'll hear a sweet song, perhaps, you know, yes. some sort of T Rex song. You know, 20th Century Boy is definitely uh, the. I, I should have publishing on that song at this point. I played it. So <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> <laughs> so, shit, Gilby. I mean, I can't tell you how thankful I am for you being on the show and just and, and just spending your time with us. I want people to be able to get in touch with you that obviously will hear about this interview afterwards. And we're all in this social media game right now. What is your social media of choice? Uh, I, I'm actually, you know, Ryan, I'm terrible on Facebook. To this day, I've never actually answered my messages on Facebook. But People are, I, people are messaging you. Trust I know. I, I, I don't know what they're asking. But I, I don't know where, what that button does. I mean, it's so funny because I'm very computer literate. You know, I have Pro Tools and, and have had it forever. But, man, I'm terrible on Facebook. So uh, Gilby GTR, which is Gilby Guitar on uh, Instagram. I, I love Instagram. Instagram is great. So I use that button where it goes to Twitter and it goes to Facebook and all that kind of stuff. But I definitely start with uh, Instagram. So And there they are to uh, my left. Right. Yeah, but I'm just I'm just doing it for the people that might be listening on Apple or Spotify or Stitcher or any of the Audible platforms. Uh, make your way on over to the YouTube channel, the Ryan Roxy official YouTube channel, and you can just click on that subscribe button to In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Of course, our guest is Gilby Clark here, and those were all his social medias. So, uh, folks, if you want to start maybe putting up a question or two, we could yeah, do that. Yeah, got some time, minute. right? We got a couple minutes. Yeah. I mean, I haven't gotten called in for dinner. I mean, I'm recording this <laughs> from Sweden. So I'm basically starting my evening already. You're just waking up. I, I really appreciate people from the uh, West Coast and Los Angeles, California, everywhere that wake up so early to listen to the live streams. And of course, Gilby for making it on there so early and starting. So I'm a I'm so fan of you, Gilby. I'm so <laughs> Thank you, Ryan Roxy, for this great show. Great. That's not so much a question as it is a statement, but thank you very much. Please. We'll take the accolades. <laughs> <laughs> we'll definitely take it, man. Do you now what is the plans uh immediately for you know until the end of the year? Have gigs yeah. Have we gotten that that weird postponed word? Are they well, you know, we can't we had a, it's it really sucks. We had a, a quite a few uh, solo shows. Uh, we had a run in Texas we were going to do that got canceled. Uh, one of them was a big motorcycle show too. And uh, we had a, a, a really good run of Kings of Chaos dates. Actually, I think they're happening like supposed to happen now between June and July. And they all got, some of them got postponed, uh, but most of them got canceled. But I just found out that we have a July 11th show that is still happening in uh, Canyonville, Oregon with Kings of Chaos. Uh, I believe it's a casino, but uh, I think we're going to try it. Uh, you know, we're going to see if uh, if we can do it. And, um, you know, obviously with all the new 
uh, restrictions. But uh, yeah, I think that's probably going to be my first show out. Canyonville, Oregon. If have you been there? Any, if there's any law, of course I have. I've been oh. there. I've, if this is a casino and <laughs> it's open for business, Alex Cooper has played it. Trust me. We were early on that, man. I'm telling you, we played casinos when when people were sort of poking fun of it, going, "What are you doing playing casinos?" And I've always said the same thing, because you know why? It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, everywhere else in the world. It's the man. same sort of scene so you know we all know the money days thursday friday saturday but you know yeah i gotta have those other gigs to fill up a tour yeah yeah hey ryan we got a question there what is that what was the first band y'all were in together What's up? candy that would be that would have been candy and and yeah. i think we got the gig because well i got the gig because i had the same uh style leather jacket as they did i wore the same uh was it there's the picture again um gilby Obviously, doing his best Chrissy Hine impression. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We've got John the Hawk Schubert on the right hand side, who is one of the best visual timekeepers you will ever know. Um, I'm I'm right next beside beside him with some sort of orbit of a, I think my hair has its own gravitation. <laughs> That's a great haircut, man. Let me tell you, <laughs> <laughs> it's one big, isn't it? And then uh, the, over to the oh, oh that's, that's great. Oh Do my you God! Remember that picture? Absolutely, absolutely, oh, man. That was, that was a Halloween. That was that a cat house or, or was it the Central or what? what, what I want to say it happened at the Viper Room, which but at Viper that Room. Time, it, was called, it was called the Central, right? Yeah. It yeah. was. And what what happened that night? Do you remember what happened that night? No, I, that I won't remember. <laughs> I remember that those. I, I can tell that those Venetian blinds are your old apartment on. I think it was Melrose Place, somewhere around there. You lived right around. Oh, that's there. right. That's my pad. Yeah, in Alpha Melrose Place. That's right, Ryan. Good job. <laughs> How's that for a memory? But that is us uh, doing. Uh, I guess white face. Is that still acceptable in 2020? <laughs> I don't even know. Is kissed face even okay to do in 2020? I'm I don't worried. know. I, I would be careful if I was them. <laughs> Well, the, the good news is that Gilby still can go hatless and me, I have to every once in a while, you know, unless I really do the hair up and put every strand in its right place, I'm, I'm wearing a headband. I'm Brett Michael has seen it before Brett Michaels. Brett Michaels was early on the headband. Uh, hey, Gilby, <laughs> what is the white SG custom you play? It was cool to see that at NAMM. There oh, the so Ryan, I've been playing an SG lately. I've been having a lot of fun with it. It's, uh, it's actually... This is interesting. It's actually a Les Paul. It's a 61 Les Paul. Uh, you know, there were a few years there where they actually did not make a traditional Les Paul, Les Paul it, shape. Yeah, they, they, they were. They, they, they called it the Les Paul, but but Les custom. Paul himself was bummed about it because yeah. he didn't like the shape, right? But it, it was yeah. just, it's just the shape of an SG, what we know. Do you know what SG stands for? Uh, solid guitar. Standard guitar. Oh my God! Really? Maybe, I, I don't was, know. You know what? You might. Be right. <laughs> I'm the one that worked for Gibson. Maybe you know. I don't know. I thought it was solid, oh, but uh, yeah, it's a '61 uh, Les Paul custom. Uh, it's white, and I took the pickup covers off. But uh, it's really fun. I, I really like it. I always say, pick, you know what? I'm telling you. Look, I have a I have an ES335 here. Ah, it looks better so without the pick guard. Yes. I, I hate pick guards. I think you the one taught me that. You know what? Yeah. You've taught me a lot of, of things of how to do it with rock and roll. But then you've gone you've gone back on a few of them, and I, I have a bone to pick with you about that. All right, I'm and ready. Let me take it. <laughs> okay. At one point, you told me, and I've to this day stayed true to it. You said that watches are not rock and roll. I Don't did ever wear a watch on stage, That's and true. I've seen you wear a watch on stage, but I never do. Ever since I only I wear a red, white, and blue wristband still, but hell, I don't yeah. wear a watch. Yeah, you know what, Ryan? You're right, and you busted me. <laughs> it's, we rock and roll should have no time, man. Come on, we you know we should we should. Right. I, it was it was a gift. I you know sometimes we got to be good husbands. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. I I and and the taking off the pit right. guard that yeah. was either between. It was, I got a little bit of that, but mostly from you, but I think a little yeah, bit. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. I've never had pick guards. I, I I hate those pick guards on there, man. They drive me insane. Well, Slash used to always take his pick guards off the Les Paul, and I thought that was cool as well, too. But uh, the other, the most famous quote that, oh, look at Brian Klesmaski. Yeah, tequila hey, brother. <laughs> when, will we get to see the two of you playing together again? I would love to. We're see in the same country play. together. <laughs> or, or not, or when, or when one of us is in town, because the last time I think um, you were in Stockholm, I came up and played with you guys. Yeah, that's you know? true. 
yeah. when you do the tour. So yeah, we will definitely make something happen, Bri. In you know, fact, every time you guys play with Alice in LA, I'm never in town. I, I've I've missed it so many times. I'm always so bummed. So I, I, I mean, I love Alice, man. Those songs are so great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gilby, what's the story about Frank Black <laughs> being on Pawn Shop Guitars? What is the story about Frank? Because at that point, Frank Black, folks, from the Pixies, well, maybe yes. I'll let Gilby tell the story and uh, why, you know, what's his involvement with it, with your first record? Well, um, we were, we are actually friends. Um, it, it, you know, it's funny, Ryan, you know why we were friends? Because we both use Vox AC30s. Um, but, <laughs> oh. it, and, uh, and it, actually what's funny is this is uh, pre GNR. Um, cause I, like I said, I, I'd had AC thirties back then. I never used them in, in candy and stuff cause we were marshals and stuff. But, uh, uh, I was in a studio, I was working a studio and the Pixies were recording and he had this great AC 30 and we just started talking and we became friends. And through the years he called me one day and he said, uh, he goes, Hey, I have a gig at McCabe's guitar shop. You know, they used to do acoustic guitar performances. He goes, and my tech can't do it. He goes, I know you're a guitar player and you're not a tech, but man, I, I'm desperate. I know you know guitars. Would you consider teching for me? And I go, yeah. I go, oh my God, that'd be so much fun. So I did it. I, I, I teched for, for, uh, for Black Francis, Frank Black, whatever you want to call him, uh, right. at McCabe's. And he paid me. And, and granted, we're probably talking, you know, 50 bucks. 80, yeah, 88, I, I, late 80s. It definitely wasn't the 90s. Uh, it be, paid me two hundred fifty dollars to tech. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I was expecting like forty, <laughs> and I was just like blown we away. We were both sound men at this place called Madam Wong, so fifty <laughs> bucks for us was like, yeah, that's the going rate. Right oh my god. god, yeah, he paid me two hundred fifty dollars. I never forget that. But anyway, we became friends, and then when uh, you know, I got the solo deal. You know, I was making my list and stuff, and and he was available and. He's so funny because when he came to track the song, uh, he played on Jail Guitar Doors. He brought uh, um, those Mesa Boogie, uh, what are those things called? The 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 uh, the high gain ones everybody uses, rectifier. Oh yeah. And I don't think I've ever even seen one before. You know, we were so Marshall and Vox and Fender, okay. and he brought one of those in and he plugged in. I was like, oh my god, that's like the biggest okay. sound I've ever heard in my life. It's so much bottom and gain and all this, but but he's such a great sport and. And, and a fun guy. I haven't seen him in so long, but man, I, I, I love him. Wow. Okay. Talking about famous people that you've guitar tech for. I'm I've guitar tech for Joe Eli. Wow. Joe Eli. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Joe, Joe Eli. Yeah. yeah. But here's the problem. He handed me a 12 string Rickenbacker to tune. Ah! <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a mediocre at best with six strings to get in tune. <laughs> Double the trouble. <laughs> Give me 12 <laughs> strings of that, man. So one, one more question we got from the chat group. If you guys are just listening to us on a audible platform, we do have a, a live chat that's going on. So some of the questions are coming from there, but uh, you were listening to uh, in the trenches with Ryan Roxy. Our guest today is Gilby Clark, a guitarist, a singer, singer, songwriter, producer, all around good guy, but mostly a motorcycle cowboy. And this question is, <laughs> Gilby, are you strictly Harleys or all types of bikes with your new shop? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Harley guy, Ryan. I mean, I, I really uh, am a vintage Harley guy. Like I, I have a knucklehead. I have a pan head and a shovel. Uh, and I also have a, a new a Road King for the long trips. But uh, you don't know what that is. But those are all vintage. Say, they just sound like band members. That do <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like pan head, color. knucklehead. You know, it's funny because I have a patch like on my vest and it says knucklehead. It's my bike. But man, when people don't know what that is, you're a knucklehead. <laughs> I'm with go, knucklehead. My dad called me that, but yeah. <laughs> wow, man. So, okay. And uh, now I'm off track because I want to talk, I want to talk guitars, but then we got motorcycle talks, but you are a motorcycle cowboy. And I remember playing that. And even to this day, I could, I mean, <laughs> it's it's embrained in our heads. <laughs> let me see. Hold on. Let me see. I don't know. I know you're in the studio right now. <laughs> oh wow, that's a little bit loud. Yeah, come yeah, on. <laughs> Yeah. We took nice. a lot of songs from uh, Jumpin' Jack Flash, I think. It's very it, much so. <laughs> it, it, when I say everything comes back to, you know, full circle, 
the new single that you put the rock and roll is getting louder it has a little bit of that stones very stones yeah. jack flash type of vibe right yeah, yeah 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 i was going for um you know it's interesting i mean you know the songs are songs you know they they do kind of like write themselves but i started with the the bass riff really and i just didn't want to do the same thing you know I, what i really want to do on this record is not like layer 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 like what i loved about bands like the beatles and stones is the bass didn't just double the guitar. The bass was its own instrument. So that's what's cool about a lot of the tracks on the record is the bass is doing completely different what the guitars are doing. And if there is a left and right guitar, they're doing different things. So I really wanted to simplify, but make the parts mean more. Well, I really loved playing with Will Efforts, who was a tequila brother. I played yes. with him again in Dad's Porno Mag. Uh, eventually, Stefan played bass as well, Stefan Adika, um, for those of you keeping track at home. Yes, I didn't <laughs> Stefan Adika's name by by contract. I have to do it at least once. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you don't have a logo going across. <laughs> it was up to him. Uh, so the thing is, I uh, had Will Efforts as a bass player, but I got him sort of hijacked him a little bit from um, from the Tequila Brothers. And Will was one of those types of bass players. All of a sudden, you know, immediately when you play bass left handed, you're cooler than everybody else because yeah. you immediately equate uh, Paul McCartney. But yes. to this day, you've taught me one of my favorite quotes, and I use it constantly in the studio to everyone's chagrin, especially Chuck Garrick's. But what <laughs> happens when we're working on, on, on a song and, and everybody's going and the bass player comes in? He's like, all right, it's ready to put his, put his tone down, this and that. You just look at him, you go, Bass is bass. <laughs> <laughs> bass is that bass. Was, that was your face. That was the quote that you gave me one time because I was like trying to think, should we do this? <laughs> bass is bass. <laughs> bass, bass. And I used it to this friggin' day. So guilty. Here's the next question for Celine. Do you play bass? <laughs> yeah, I play bass. <laughs> you play maybe too much. <laughs> I actually, you know what I have mine? I have a Hoffner. I I I I love playing a Hoffner bass. I've been I found these. Thick rubber picks. Wait, I wonder if I have one around. Oh, okay. Cool. Hold on. Okay, really? We're going to show you. We're going to show you. We're going to show you a new trick. Here they are. Can you see that? Yes, I can. What is okay. that? So, so that's a rubber pick. It's it's rubber, right? Uh -huh. And uh, what I Name do is <laughs> exactly. So what I do is uh, I use the rubber pick to play bass, and it actually sounds like fingers. You know, because I, I love the sound of fingers, but man, I cannot play finger bass for, for crap. So uh, I, I use this pick with, with the Hoffner and it, and it does, it really does sound like doom, 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 but without that pick, uh, pickup noise, you know, when you hit the, the string against the pick, the pickup, it goes click, click, click. Oh my God, it drives me insane. But you've made, uh, you've made records and you've played with some of the, you know, the most well known bass players in the world and most identifiable sort of bass tones in the world if you really want to break it down. But because Duff himself on that oh, album, yeah. construction album, that tone is was that pick or was that fingers or what was that? And what was That's it? All and, and you know what's interesting about uh, Duff's tone? And I got to tell you, man, I, I, you know, when I first joined the band, I didn't really get it. I mean, I got it on the record, but, you know, there's no low end. You know, on his tone, there's no low end. It's almost like a guitar, but he doesn't play like a guitar player. He plays like a bass player. And it's so melodic. It, it really, to me, it grew to like a McCartney kind of thing. You know, the way he was so yeah. melodic in his playing. And he mm. found his place. You know, he wasn't just going, dum, 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 you know, but he, uh, like I said, just all those notes, it's just very melodic. It reminded me of McCartney. I think the album, the, the the book that you turned me on to with McCartney was, uh, or the, about the Beatles, the best one to to read was, I think it was you that, or you oh, was the love you make, the love you make, exactly. That's a great book. Great that book. was a great book to because you really did understand. There was another one that came off uh, a couple of years later by uh, Jeffrey uh, Geoff Emmerich. Je Jeff and Jeff Emmerich. Yeah, and he wrote he wrote a book as well about the Beatles, and it really was uh, inspiring and stuff. So yeah. there you go. Wasn't the Jeff Emmerich book more about the like recording and stuff? It is about the recording process and yeah, how yeah, yeah. Would, they would close down the studio and, and basically it would just be Paul McCartney listening to the tracks, coming up with his bass parts, which usually is weird because you, bass and drums sort of go together, but he would wait. Yeah until the drums were done and then he and, and started the guitar was done so you could say well, how can i 
move this around and move the right notes. So obviously, yeah. have you ever gotten to jam with any of the any of the Beatles? No, no, never, never, okay. no, right. no. I've never, I've never even met a Beatle. <laughs> I'd love to. Uh, have yeah, you met a Beatle? I, I took a P next to uh, the drummer of the Rolling Stones, Charlie Watts. And wow. I, yeah, I, at one time. We, we, I, I've peed next that, That's another, another faint, weird thing about me that I've done. I've, I've peed next to a lot of famous people. I mean, me and you. <laughs> so, so do you stalk them people. when they go in the bathroom? And they- <laughs> totally not stalk him. But I peed next to <laughs> the drummer of the Rolling Stones, Charlie Watts, and – Hugh Hefner at the Roxy. That's pretty rock and roll. Wow, that is very who's, rock and roll. Who's your most famous P next to guy? <laughs> wow. I and Tommy Lee. I P next to Tommy Lee at the LA Forum Club. And you know what he did to me? He goes, uh, What's up, dude? Hey, dude. <laughs> <laughs> while he's while he's in the middle midstream. <laughs> that was probably, you know, most of my conversations with the, the two-year run that we did with Motley Crue and Alice Cooper was mostly like, What's up, dude? What's up, dude? <laughs> You, you played in the band with Tommy as well. You played yeah. in uh, as far as um, what was, how did that all come about? Because that was a, again, I'm, I'm the, the name, uh, what was it? Rock and roll. Rock star super, uh, rock, uh, I got rock, rock, rock star supernova. Yeah. I hated that name. And, but, and, uh, <laughs> what ended up happening with that whole project? Because it seemed like a, a perfect storm that was, you know, yeah, it was go. just quick. It really was, a, you know, a TV show, a record, a tour, and boom, you know, that was it. And that was really all it was it t- intended to be. I mean, it, uh, you know, in the beginning, it, it's matter of fact, oh my God, Ryan, I just remembered something. You were involved in the beginning process of that. Did you or didn't you, didn't we audition for when they did the first season of we Rockstar? The backup band. The backup band. It was me, you, and, and the guys from the Black Crows, Johnny and uh, uh, Steve he Norman, was, right? And, yeah, and Teddy Zigzag was there again. As yeah. far as it, it, just like in your new video. I think it was the – we called those guys, all of us, the usual suspects. We went in. <laughs> I'm not sure who ended up being the backup band. I think it was – No, no, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what happened. So let me – so, so check it out. So we did it, and we actually, apparently, here's what happened. We impressed the producer, Mark Burnett, who's gone on you know, to produce you know, a million, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, reality TV show, Survivor and Apprentice and all that stuff. But anyway, they, they really liked us. So when the next year came along to do the next show, I got a call from the producer, and he goes, you know, we never forgot you guys. He goes, we really liked you, but we thought that having guys – you know, that kind of have a name would draw away from the singers because some of these singers are young and, you know, they're not amateurs, but, you know, they they haven't really developed yet. And we th- thought that the band might make them look small. So he goes, so that's why they went with more of like a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a, a studio kind of band. Not, I don't want to say faceless because they're not. They're, they were amazing oh. musicians. I remember who got that gig, uh, Sasha, the bass player, who I played yeah. with, Al Bachman. Who I, yeah. you know, I, ended up, I had originally played with him and Mark Shulman and Tal Bachman. You see how this, all this stuff is just incestuous. Isn't uh, it crazy? <laughs> well, that's, obviously I had, I had moved to uh, Sweden at that point during that second time. But I remember watching the show Rockstar Supernova from Sweden because yeah. it was a different show worldwide and stuff. And, and again, another bass player that you got to play with Jason Newstead. Um, yeah. That was an, I mean, <laughs> What's his so, like? so here's what happened. So they, they called me and they said, you know, you, we want to start a band. We want to start a band from fresh and then find a singer to join the band. There was actually talks of when they were doing Velvet Revolver before they actually found Scott Weiland that they were going to be the band, you know, to look for a singer. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, tell me who you would have in your perfect, you know, like all-star rock band. So I gave him a bunch of names. Like I gave him, you know, a good old buddy, Eric Singer and, you know, all, all kinds of, you know, you know, all of our friends and everything. Usual suspects. The usual suspects. But <laughs> while that was happening, Tommy ran into Mark Burnett uh, in Malibu somewhere, and he told him what was happening. And Tommy goes, oh, my God, I want to do it. <laughs> you, know, you know, dude, dude, dude I, I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so Tommy came in, and suddenly, you know, that storm that comes with Tommy came in. And, and, uh, and, you know, we were talking about bass players, and Tommy immediately goes, man, Motley Crue, Guns N' Roses, we need Metallica, you know. And so they called Jason. and Jason idea, actually, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so Jason came aboard, you know, and uh, and there it was. What was hard, it, there was a lot of things that were good and a lot of things that were hard. Number one, uh, 
man, it, it's hard with three guys getting together to write new music. And we're very, Tommy and I are actually a lot on the same page. We're like, he loves cheap trick, you know, uh, uh, you know, the sweet he, he's, but he also likes a lot of rap and, and, uh, you know, like urban kind of music. Uh, but Jason is just, you know, metal. <laughs> he's heavy, really. I, th I thought he'd be more on the punk rock edge. Okay, not not that. at all. He's he's met like every one of his songs was metal. You know, it was uh, you know a very riffy, just very metal. So it was hard. But they, we brought in Butch Walker to produce the record, and Butch really right. kind of helped. You know, to I to tell you the truth, it wasn't like my gig to produce it. Butch did a fantastic job, and uh, but yeah, it was really just intended as a TV show. Uh, you know, a tour and record, and, and boom, nobody got hurt. For, for those of you musicians that are listening out there, whether you're watching on YouTube or whether you're watching on Facebook or you know any other platform, all these names that we're saying, these are definite rabbit holes you can go down and learn a lot of information <laughs> from. Because actually, Butch Walker's great. In fact. You know, my thing is like, if you don't like cheap chick, you probably won't be on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good rule to go by. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, how do, is is a bit free, refreshing in the urinals with Ryan Roxy? I love that. <laughs> now everybody's just bragging <laughs> about it. I love it. Who they peed next to? <laughs> who, who started that? Who started that? So doesn't it feel refreshing not to have one direct GNR question or a question about Slash for? A oh whole my God! Time. I didn't even know. It's good job. Good job. I and like. I like your thing. people. <laughs> we have both. We have both played with Slash in the oh same God. band, but not at the same time. So just <laughs> so for those of you that are keeping score at home, this is the guy that played on. It's five o'clock somewhere. I'm the guy. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm the guy that played on Ain't Life Grand. All right. He had Eric Dover singing. I had Rod Jackson singing. Oh, yeah. Great there. Yeah. Uh, you, you had oh wait who did you have on bass yeah, didn't you have uh... uh well mike inez played on the record uh mike inez and matt uh sorum played on the record but the tour was brian tishy and james lomenzo all right and we had you know we made that i don't know about you ryan but we made that whole record before dover came along like recorded it, it was done he tells that story he said he goes i had to write an album of lyrics with yeah. An entire album of music done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was done. Yeah, done. Like, and, and you know, Slash, you know, it, it is what it is. <laughs> no, I know, but Slash had some great riffs on that album. He had some great riffs on, on, on uh, well, had some, I thought it was some of his yeah. best playing yeah. on it. Yeah, both I, records. Some really great guitar playing. Yeah. No doubt. Um, we had John, I just want to give our, our rhythm section some some cred as well, because we had Johnny Grupark on bass and Matt Log on the drums for that band. And I think Teddy Zigzag, being the uh, ultimate politician that he was, probably played on both albums. Right? Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he definitely played on, on the record I did. I'm sure he did on yours. So. Oh, well, for those of you that want to check out either album, there's obviously no competition at all. You can check out both of them. Neither of us will see any publishing from it. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I do get checks. I do. <laughs> I do. They're small, but you know. Because <laughs> I actually, I contributed. A, well, there's a song that's just, I wrote uh, on that record by myself. And I had a couple of co writes with them, so. All right. Don't tell me it's in a new Geico commercial or I'm going to get rat envy now. I, so someone, someone actually emailed me today and says, you know, that rat is charting again because they're on an yeah. insurance commercial record. I said, well, that's great for Bobby Blotzer. Actually, Warren has uh, been playing in Kings of Chaos. Uh, uh -huh. The last shows we did, Warren Demartini was in it. There he is. There's there's someone that peed next to Ryan Roxy. Um, I, you know what? No, actually, you know what? That's not just someone. That's Robbie Miller, and I have his pick today because he sent me his, his official EP. So there you go. Take a smile. Uh, bonus. There you go. Um, there was a question up that said, do you have any plans of writing some sort of biography? Are you waiting for everyone to pass on before? <laughs> before well, do I have any plans? No, but I mean, it has been brought up. You know, I've, I've had people approach me. I've had uh, publishing companies approach me. I just, uh, I'm, I'm not there yet. You know, you know, Ryan, it's, it's strange because, you know, Matt's got a book coming out soon and I kind of felt like the GNR thing has been covered well. And I know that there's more to my life than, than just GNR, but, um, I don't know. At, at some point it might be fun. I mean, like, so we have some great stories about, exactly. you know, pre all that and, and after, and we've worked with post. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I work with a lot of different people. They're good stories. I think for musicians, you know, to hear these things of how, some of us came up that, you know, aren't, you know, you know, I didn't learn play guitar, you know, in school or teacher, it's just playing, you know, the clubs and stuff. So, you know, maybe at some point, it's definitely something in the back of my mind. I just, you know, 
Got to do. We'll just it. start a, start a podcast, but just don't go. Don't air a live stream the same time as me, and we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> but Federock asks uh, Gilby, "Who's the artist you'd like to play with amongst those that you have never collaborated with?" Wow, that's that's that, that's an a interesting Beatle would one. Be nice. a Beatle, thank you. You know, Ryan, good job. A Beatle, yeah. I mean, Paul McCartney. I mean, his hit to me. His live band is phenomenal. I, I can't say how much I love, you know, that he's got, you know, you know, two guitars, you know, bass and drums, and he keeps it raw, and they all sing. I, I love his band, and I think he's still an incredible musician. We've played many Beatles songs together uh, on stage, together in a band, and uh, you know, on stage. What is your favorite Beatles song? To that's a hard one, man. I, just like everything, my 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 favorites change. You know, like a you know, like a, I might like a, 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 a Ziggy Stardust by Bowie. You know, one two or three months, and then later I, I change to Hang On to Yourself. You know, so Beatles. Um, it's a strange one. I, I mean, I, I, I really like uh, the most. I know which one we've both played the most. <laughs> like oh. The sky. <laughs> oh, oh my God, Elton Skelter. <laughs> yeah, we've all played that. We played it a lot and probably haven't played it right once. <laughs> oh, no, no. no. But it's you easy. have, maybe not me. Well, no, because we never, every, whoever you jam with either plays. Are we doing the Motley Crue version? Or are we doing yeah, the exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, hey, Gilby, I'm going to wrap things up. I just want to thank you once more for coming on in the trenches for all the people that have been hanging around the entire time. I've been watching you. I've been seeing, even though I can't really read with these uh, reader glasses on, I'm going to have to up my prescription pretty soon, but I've been seeing you've been very active. I appreciate it. Uh, Gilby, will you please one more time, just tell the folks uh, where to find you on social media for those of you listening on the audible platforms and we'll show them up. Yes, on the so screen. once again, I'm really active on Instagram, which is Gilby, G I L B Y G T R Gilby G T R everything else on Facebook and Twitter is my name, Gilby Clark Clark's got an E and uh, there you go. They're all to my left. There you go. And how about next time uh, that you come on, we catch up a little bit more. Maybe it's some time that we're both in the same proximity of each other and hopefully on the, on the same stage at one point for sure. Yeah. 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 I, like, so I got to catch Alice again. I haven't seen it in so long. You know, I would love to see you guys play again. Next time. We'll, we'll, you know what? Just tell us when you're going to be in LA and then we'll, then that's when we'll put the actual LA date on sale. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> you got it. I'll work on that. I'm we sure were cares. supposed to be playing the Hollywood Bowl the the, the night that all those uh, all the rioting and everything a couple of weeks no, ago. If, really? if, things, if we were back in the normal world where there is no normal world anymore, no. maybe we'll go to some sort of new normal. But uh, yeah, we were supposed to be playing the Hollywood Bowl, but uh, it's weird how things work out. But yeah. uh, either way, it's always good to talk to you, Gilby. And it's um, I'm, I'm glad that you we were able to come on and, and sort of share a lot of these stories of what's happened over the years because you tend to – they sort of fuzz out, but then, then, then you yeah. go, oh, I get it, yeah. you know. So another yeah. great quality chat. I pre appreciate you guys uh, hanging out. having me. It. And uh, Gilby, well, hey, man, hang on for the line for a second while I, while I uh, sort of – say my piece and stuff. If there's it, anything else you need to say to the crowd? No, we're good, brother. You, you, you took care of it all, man. I really appreciate everybody tuning in, man. It's uh, definitely been fun. I had a good, big smile the whole time. Awesome, man. Well, we, our guest today has been Gilby Clark and of so many things. I don't even want to start giving, uh, releasing all his accolades. You'll just have to listen to the podcast once over all those names that we dropped. You're going to have to go down those rabbit holes as well. And anytime you want to, uh, subscribe to our channel, please do so. It's uh, in the trenches with Ryan Roxy, hit that subscribe button and everybody until next time, I'm Ryan Roxy. Enjoy the ride. Trenches with Ryan Roxy. <laughs> That's great.